Okay, so, um, so what I've tried to do today is I'm primarily going to focus on the non-structural uh, engineers, civil engineers who are not in my field. And I will focus a lot on what we are doing uh, because how we are doing it is, uh, is reserved for reading a technical paper and so on. So we'll talk about what we are doing, why is it important, what is the context in which we are doing, and what are the challenges and opportunities in the area of smart infrastructure. Now, although uh, this directly doesn't address energy uh, related aspects as with WISE, much of the technology that goes into looking at smart infrastructure uh, can be directly applied to the energy infrastructure. So as far as the domain itself goes, the applications are fairly portable. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is some of the things that we have been involved in. My group, I have a few students here as well. Uh, so just highlight what we are doing, how we are doing, what are the challenges, and give the overall context so that at the end of this uh, lecture, at least my seminar, uh, you would have a, a broad idea of what smart infrastructure is and what are the problems that are specific to smart infrastructure. Um, so let's talk first about the motivation for this work. Um, so what is the big picture? What, what is smart infrastructure? What, is, what do we mean by smart infrastructure? Because it seems like a lot of buzzwords. Um, essentially, what we have is uh, a piece of infrastructure. Of course, the infrastructure may or may not be smart. When I say smart, I mean uh, it has embedded uh, capabilities to sense its states uh, or ability to actuate or change its state. So any of these things, whether it's got the ability to sense or actuate, uh, makes it smart. Okay, so it's a very loose word that's, that's given to, uh, to this field. Um, so once you have a piece of infrastructure and you have the ability to sense its state and actuate its states, uh, then you can feed this information back into a, a, a computational platform, uh, an algorithmic uh, platform, where this information is processed and the requisite steps, be it uh, maintenance, be it uh, uh, some sort of a control, uh, anything you can think of, uh, that can be made possible by this computational platform, uh, can affect back this piece of infrastructure, and that makes this whole circle, the whole closed loop system, a smart infrastructure platform. Okay, so that's sort of like the general loose, nebulous definition of what this smart infrastructure is. So of course, um, a lot of it is based on the application. So every application is different. Uh, you don't have uh, the same types of sensors that are uh, widely uh, applicable to different applications. Uh, you might have actuation that is achieved at a different uh, force levels, different time scales, and so on. So uh, we will, I will show you two or three pieces of applications that we are working on in my group. Uh, but before we go do that, I just want to take the first 10 minutes or so, just broadly laying out what the problem is, what is the theoretical background in this, what are the computational elements of this, uh, uh, of this problem. So I will take the first 10 minutes to sort of give you that overview. Now, first is the motivation. So, when, where is all of this coming from? Where is all the, uh, the, the push to look at uh, infrastructure or embed infrastructure with sensors coming from? If you look at the average sensor forecast, this was from the Goldman, Goldman Sachs report. Uh, the cost of sensors has been dropping continuously for the last decade at least. And the projected estimates by 2020, it's about 38 cents. Of course, you know, a lot of it, I think, are dealing with MEMS-type sensors, uh, which are semiconductor-based semiconductor sensors. And you can see the cost of sensors is a big driver, uh, where it was uh, at least several times more expensive to sense them uh, a, a decade ago. Now it has become very cheap to probe the condition of uh, large uh, geospatially uh, large domains uh, with sensors at a relatively lower cost. My suspicion is this cost is even lower now than they projected it at 2020. So cost is definitely a big driver. Our ability to, uh, to uh, blanket large uh, areas, uh, like you know, people are, 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 are blanketing forest regions with sensors. So I think this is definitely a big driver in, in, in what, we are, what I'm going to talk about today. The other uh, piece of uh, uh, survey that is important is uh, if you look at same 2018, 2019 estimates, and this study was done around 20, end, of, uh, end of 2015 or beginning of 2015, uh, where the applications of these sensors are going to be in the next decade, 
uh, 40% of the applications for these sensors are going to be in the government and infrastructure. So infrastructure is a very big player in where these sensors are going to find a home. And you, you're looking at it at this axis in the number of billions of devices. So uh, this sort of nicely blends into this discussion of IoT, the Internet of Things, where people are talking about uh, populating large uh, areas, devices, every appliance. I've seen, uh, I've seen sensors being put on uh, whiskey bottle caps to know whether something has been tampered with. So you think about an application, there are IoT sensors that are finding its way there. So you're talking billions, and people are talking now about trillions of devices that are going to show up. And infrastructure is a big, big, big portion of, uh, of where the sensors are eventually going to find a home. And as a result, it's very important for us to understand uh, just because you have sensors doesn't mean you have knowledge about what you want to do. Uh, sensors just provide you a window through which you can analyze your system. So the understanding that we need to have right now is when you're going to have this billions and possibly trillions of devices, what is that we can extract out of this information? So we really have to think about what are we going to do with it? Just because you're going to have a race car, what are you going to do with the race car? Right? If you, all you're doing is driving to the grocery store, it's not a real good use of a race car. So I think we need to understand, just because we have billions of devices, we need to understand what, what are you going to do with it. So that sort of provides the context in which we are going to look at it. Now, before we understand what we can do with it, what we should first understand is what we are doing with it currently, as of today. Right? Uh, where is the field at? Where is, how do we calibrate where we are at right now? So here's a project that we worked on. Uh, this is a dam in Bulgaria. This we worked on uh, right around the time I started here at Waterloo in 2006 uh, timeframe. Um, so this should be actually 2016. Uh, so what? Uh, this is an 80 megawatt hydroelectric dam that's out in Bulgaria, and this has got all sorts of sensors that are that are measuring all sorts of things about the dam. For example, there are uh, there are extensometers that will tell you how much a, uh, a, a section of the dam is, uh, uh, is, is expanding or contracting. There are borehole sensors that will look at soil pressures and their subsidence, uh, what, what's happening underneath, uh, scour and so on at this dam. There are inclinometers, uh, there are strain gauges, there are hundreds and hundreds of devices that are currently measuring uh, all sorts of parameters within this dam. And uh, the, the reason why I bring this up is there are over 300 sensors measuring these responses. But when we started looking at it, and even to, till today, there is no knowledge of the dam's performance. So the question is, what are they measuring? Why are they measuring? So the idea here is you spend millions of dollars and you instrument a large infrastructure project such as the dam, and you're collecting reams and reams and reams of data but the fundamental question of what do you do with the data, what is the data giving you in terms of knowledge about a structure's performance, is still very nebulous, and it's still not addressed. And of course, every application is different. There's no one size fits all where you, you apply this thing and you're going to get this information. But at least one starts to think about, wait a minute, maybe the problem is not in our ability to put sensors. Our problem right now we have to really tackle is what to do with all the data it's collecting. So that brings to the main motivation of what my group uh, here at Waterloo is looking at is uh, taking data and converting into some actionable information, and that actionable information is through knowledge that we gather from the data. Okay, so that's really at the core of what we do. But again, this this is what I think about as uh, actualization, right? So uh, to go from data to knowledge, you cannot work in the abstract. Some of the mathematical concepts that I'm going to just give you an overview of can be done in abstract. There are standard tools you can throw at them. Uh, the, the area of Bayesian analysis and Bayesian inference is very well developed. But I think if you want to go from data to knowledge, you cannot go in a vacuum. You have to look at a particular application, and you have to ask yourself, how do I go from this data 
to something that's actionable that I can work with. And that is essentially what I call actualization. Without actualization, a lot of the IoT technologies are not going to be useful. They're going to stay in the academic realms without actually being translated into something that's useful. We are in engineering, so we want to make sure that whatever we are developing also is translated into what something that we can actually act upon. Um, one of the main aspects of this is actually autonomy. Right? I always say uh, uh, this, when, when you give a piece of technology to a user who doesn't understand the technology itself, but you want the user to use that piece of technology, the only way you're going to affect the change is through autonomy. So uh, I always take this example. My dad is 80 years old, and he has never held a smartphone in his hand until, say, about three, four years ago. And I got him his first iPhone. And I was actually very, I got him a very late model, uh, a very early model iPhone, because I wasn't sure if I was going to use it or not. And he, I thought he was going to be a lost without all the punching keys. It turns out six months later, he was using it without any problem. And to me, that's very eye-opening, because a lot of it is through the automation that is taking place in these smartphones. For instance, my father doesn't need to understand how an iPhone works, what kind of a processor it is, and what kind of SDK that has. But all he has to understand is, what do I need to do to get me what I want to see? So he has a bunch of things he clicks on, and he's able to get comfortable with it. I think that is the link we are trying to bridge in infrastructure, because a lot of the uh, onus right now in understanding data is with the user, i.e. consultant or the owner, which is actually becoming the biggest stumbling block in the adoption of sensor technology into infrastructure applications. Infrastructure applications are lagging behind other applications, but at least a generation. And in my opinion, a lot of it is because of the lack of automation. And I think this is very important uh, to understand. And that's why we have not solved the problem. We have barely scratched the surface. But this is the question we are asking. Whatever we are doing, how do you automate this? Okay, how do you automate it so that the burden or the onus of understanding the technology is removed from the user and brought it into the system itself, system design itself, so that these changes can be made at the upstream uh, phase of the project rather than trying the user to familiarize him or herself with the technology. So the specific questions that we are asking in our group is, how can we ascertain? So of course, when you talk about uh, infrastructure, you're primarily interested in something is going wrong. Because if a dam is there and it's producing what you're produce, what it's supposed to be producing, you're not interested in the dam. Right? So, but you only are interested in these things when there is something happening to the structure. For example, there's a damage. There's a fault in an electromechanical system. Then you're all of a sudden interested in it. So one of the fundamental questions we are asking is, how are you going to uh, ascertain these things in an autonomous or a semi-autonomous fashion? Semi-autonomous is saying, OK, some of the things we cannot, at this stage, understand how to make them autonomous. But we can at least try to move in the direction of autonomy. The other question, how we are, what we are asking is, how do you use the sensory data just beyond damage and fault detection? Because if you have damage and faults, that's one piece of the puzzle. But what if everything is working well? Is the data providing you anything useful? Uh, it is collecting terabytes and terabytes of uh, uh, data. You're collecting terabytes of data. What, are, what is it useful for if it is not just for damage or fault detection? Are there things other than that that you can use this data for? In other words, can you predict what is the remaining useful life for these systems so that you can develop maintenance plans, you can develop inspection intervals, and so on, which can go into asset management on a day-to-day -day basis that can further optimize asset inspections and operations? Cost. So I'll go through some of these details in, in just a second. Then uh, many of these systems, and, and this is where a very important distinction comes in, is civil engineering infrastructure, especially dams, bridges, and so on, they're long life systems. When I say long life, it's synonymous with highly reliable systems. Highly reliable systems are great. But from a mathematical standpoint, they're actually a very big problem because highly reliable systems also have very few prior data, failure data. If you don't have prior failure data, you cannot drive your models mathematically properly. So a lot of the problems that have been solved in the industrial engineering realm when we talk about bearing faults or we talk about small components, which have relatively short uh, lifetimes, 
speaking relatively, let's think about relative to our careers, right? That means you can take it to a lab, you can run these things to destructively test them, and you can generate a lot of these statistical estimates on their uh, useful lives. Uh, if you're dealing with a dam, what is the failure life for a dam? They're designed to last pretty much beyond our lifetimes. So how are you going to uh, pro pro prognose failures when something is designed for such a long lifetime? So this is actually a very fundamental problem in, in, in infrastructure applications where you're dealing with traditionally very low speed, highly reliable systems. So how do you address these problems? So you have to be clever in the way we structure our, our, our modeling. And for, last but not the least, uh, you, cannot, um, you cannot look at uh, 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 smart infrastructure as a component and just work on one component. For example, you cannot just look at a algorithms and just develop algorithms only for the rest of your career because in order for us to actualize smart infrastructure, you have to look at all components of smart infrastructure and primary among them the data acquisition platform. So you have to look at how to design these hardware platforms and design decision support tools. That means you have to work at the, the, all these components of, these, uh, uh, of the smart infrastructure so that you can design each specific component to work with the other in, in somewhat seamless autonomous fashion. So these are some of the specific questions that our group is trying to address. Now let me, before I get into the applications, which I think are the interesting part, I want to get something out of the way. So I want to sort of encapsulate the basic idea of what we are doing in just a few slides. What is the mathematical basis of a lot of the things that we are doing? So the problem statement is, let us say you have a system that's a closed system. Most of the systems that we are looking at are very closed. Uh, you won't have access to the fault where it's happening. So you have to observe the faults either indirectly, indirectly could mean from a large, uh, where the transmission part characteristics are significant, or the paths are very convolved. So you cannot get close to the fault location. You would observe it from a distance. And the transmission paths from the fault to where you're measuring, these are, let us say, your sensor, conceptually, these are your sensor locations, they are far removed from the fault location so that the transmission path characteristics are fairly complex. So that makes the problem very challenging because what you're observing is maybe has effect from the fault, but it also has effects from other things that are a result of the transmission path. So this is one of the challenges in extracting uh, the damage sensitive features or fault sensitive features from the measurements that you're observing at the sensor level. So how do you do this? How do you pose this problem? Uh, mathematically, uh, you have what is called an environment model. The environment model could be physics-based. Uh, if you have a oscillator type system, it could be defined by an ordinary differential equation or a partial differential equation. Uh, then, or if you have purely a data-driven model like we do, uh, this environment model can be parameterized by either linear random variable type models or stochastic type models. Uh, that is basically forms your environment model, and that is basically a, 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 a virtual representation or an abstraction of your physical system. So let us say you have some way to construct an environment model, which I'll come to in just a second. Then this environment models are driven by essentially two things. The first one is the historical data. For example, this could be in a Bayesian sense, these are the priors that are driving the parameter estimates if, you're, if, you're, if your environment model is parameterized by certain uh, uh, certain variables, uh, these are driving the prior estimates. That means this, this encapsulates what is the prior knowledge you have in your system. And this is very important when you come to infrastructure because a lot of times you would go to a, a piece of machinery and the technician would tell you, yeah, I think that sound is is something wrong with the, with the bearing inside. And that sort of information is very qualitative, but you would be able to capture these things in this prior knowledge framework, in the Bayesian framework. Now, the other important component is uh, the sensory data. So when the environment model requests for some information, that information is gathered from your system, which is your physical system that is unobservable directly. And then you have data acquisition that captures this data, puts it back into the environment model, and you're massaging this information in a way that will allow you to do a number of things. So as I said initially, the, uh, the uh, environment model could be mechanistic or data driven. So it doesn't matter, it could be any type of model and, and, and they all lend themselves to, to, the, to the framework I'm gonna talk about. So the, one of the most important components in what we do is updating the environment model. I think of this as three pillars. You have, uh, uh, you have a, the environment model, you have some prior knowledge, there's some measurements, so three, three blocks I showed you earlier. 
Uh, let us say this would be some hypothesis or some model parameters. So you're mathematically, all you're doing in a very simple way, you're calculating the model parameters conditioned on some hypothesis or conditioned on some data that you're observing. And this is given by your standard Bayes theorem, which is uh, a product of the likelihood of observing those values times the prior. Okay, so in other words, if you're able to calculate the posteriority from the data, from the prior knowledge and from the data you're observing, you're mathematically your problem is solved. A lot of the automation challenges occur in going from this to this in some sort of an automated way. Okay, so that is really the, the crux of the problem that we are trying to solve. So in terms of, so what if you know the environment model? What if you calculate the posterior of the parameters? Then the problem becomes very simple. You have a certain model, either this model is physics based or so data driven. You project these models at any given time. Let us say you're taking some measurements. You project it onto some failure threshold, and that, that remains to be seen what we mean by failure. Once you project it onto some sort of a failure uh, threshold, you will end up with some uncertain estimates of your remaining useful life. So essentially, what an engineer or, a, uh, or an infrastructure owner wants to know is, if I put my sensor here, and if my sensor is giving me this data, when should I inspect next? Or how much life does it have remaining? I've designed it for 30 years. This is 29th year. Do I have to replace this bridge next year? Or can I wait for another six years? And that is, going to, that is given by this distribution that allows you, that is basically calculated through a combination of prior knowledge and the environmental model, the environment model that you've captured, and projecting that model onto the failure threshold. That's it. That encapsulates the underlying theory of what we are trying to do. Of course, just in passing, I want to note that uh, uh, these environment models could be simply random variable models. Here you could have multi-phase degradation models, or you can have single-phase degradation models. You can parameterize them in any way. The underlying models could be anything. And you can say that, okay, if I have a damage in the system, I can capture this damage through some sort of a discontinuity in my model. In this case, it would be a slope discontinuity. These are very standard uh, methods in statistics and in Bayesian literature to estimate these things if you want to do it in the Bayesian way. Uh, you could also go to capture the temporal uncertainty. That means we say that, look, my degradation rate is changing. You know, winters, things degrade worse than summer. So that means there's temporal variations that occur between seasons. So if you want to go the extra step and model these degradation, uh, you could do them. You could take stochastic process models that can capture this sort of temporal uncertainty. Again, the Bayesian mathematics associated with these gamma process models and other Wiener process and other Levy process models is very well established. There's nothing new we have to do from an engineering standpoint other than to apply them correctly and access the data that are going to drive these environment models properly. So we're not inventing new Bayesian mathematics here. We are using them intelligently, and we are using them in such a way that the, the information that is coming from our sensors is captured in these models appropriately. Okay? So um, again, you know, there, there are, there's one thing I want to notice is, uh, and I always say the best research is something that confirms you what you already know through common sense. That's all I will see. So uh, if I were to count, uh, uh, if I were to say, for example, I have some sort of a degradation paths, and I have multiple time uh, instances in which I can monitor a condition. Think of this as some degradation in a in a in a steel reinforcement inside a bridge. And I let us say I come at I go there at time some time t1. I take some measurements, as some prior knowledge about the degradation there. I project it into the, some fly failure threshold. I have some estimate of the remaining useful life of that particular component of the bridge. And then I come back at a time t2 and project it into the same failure surface. I get another remaining useful life. Of course, the longer I wait and the closer I have to the, its actual failure time, the more certain, or in other words, reduced uncertainty I will have regarding its remaining useful life. Okay, So as we go closer and closer to its 
uh, end of life, you're going to get better and better confidence in the remaining useful life estimates. This is common sense. You would think, yeah, I think that's no brainer. But this, you can actually show it mathematically that it's, it's the case because when you're measuring it very early on, all these estimates are driven by the priors, the prior knowledge. As you go closer and closer to its end of life, they're driven more by the estimates you're actually getting from the data. That means the data is better informing your estimates on the remaining useful life than just your priors. Okay, very standard stuff in reliability literature, but I just wanted to point out. So the estimation steps is very simple. You parameterize the system. You calculate your posteriories using standard base methods. Uh, you can estimate these parameters using you know, maximal likelihood distribution fitting. There are a slew of methods in mathematics and statistics that can do it. And then once you have the RUL, then your problem is pretty much solved as far as we are concerned. That's the background. Okay, so the last 10 minutes, uh, what, what I've tried to present you is, the, is, is a background in, in what is the mathematics, what is the theory that is driving a lot of the things I'm going to talk about because I'm not going to go back and revisit the theory for any of the applications. So coming back to the motivation, one of the things I said at the very beginning is uh, in order for a technology to be useful, uh, it also has to be somewhat autonomous. It has to, that means the burden of understanding the technology should not be with the user. It has to, the technology should take care of interpreting data and providing useful information that's actionable to the user. Only then such a technology is considered to be successful, right? Imagine for a minute if smartphones ex expected every time you want to use it, you have to write a little script to use a smartphone email function. Nobody would use it except a handful, right? So I think that's the same idea here. So. The question I've started to ask in the last few years is what are those actualization enablers? So what would, what are the enablers that, uh, that cause this actualization to happen? And I really, in my mind, I have framed this as three distinct things primarily driven by what we are doing. The first is the case for automation. Okay, one of the things is uh, whatever we are doing, any platform we are doing, whether it's a data acquisition system, uh, there's, uh, whether it is a, an algorithm that, that's running on the platform, they have to be automated in a way that a lot of the functions are inbuilt, okay? So I'm gonna show in a case study uh, where the automation is how we have implemented it, okay? Then there is another enabler for actualization, which is an intelligent edge. So what this means is a lot of the a lot of the devices. It's not enough if you have a sensor that just collecting data and throwing out into throwing this into your computer or into the cloud or wherever. I think gone are the days where that is sufficient because data in most infrastructure applications nowadays uh, is, is, is expensive. Uh, I mean, cellular connectivity is ubiquitous, but it's also expensive. So if you're collecting things like acoustic data, uh, managing the data, how, how much of the data you need, how much of the data you don't need uh, is very important. In computer science, I don't know, You've heard of these things, terms called a complex event processing, for example, right? Instead of running queries on a database, you run your data through queries. That means only a very select uh, pieces of data are retained. The other data set is just completely lost in vapor. The advantage of doing things like that is you don't have to store everything you collect. You only collect things that are important and useful for you. That will reduce your overheads. So that's where the intelligent edge comes in, where you bring automation into the sensor itself so that some level of processing is done at the sensor so that only a, only a small fraction of that information, useful information, is transmitted for further processing. The rest of it is basically junk. So that reduces cost. So that is the second actualization enabler. The third actualization enabler is robotics, in, in, in my opinion, because a lot of these platforms uh, are very uh, human dependent right now and inspector dependent. We want to be looking at uh, robotic platforms to be able to collect these data intelligently, fuse data from different sensor modalities. So these are the three actuation enablers I'm going to talk about uh, in, uh, in, in, in the applications realm. So um, for, for the first case, the case for automation, uh, we can look at, I'll show you some examples of civil industrial infrastructure. Uh, what I'm showing you is typical types of uh, uh, entities that we are measuring. Uh, this is basically a, a piece of uh, beam uh, with corroder rebar in there. The idea here is the degradation here we are interested in is, is corrosion within concrete, but this corrosion within concrete is embedded. Okay, there are some visual signs when you go down in Gardner, you have an idea how this looks like, uh, but oftentimes these degradations remain hidden and it loses 
this bond after a particular period of time. So how do you actually detect failures like this before they happen from sensors that are mounted outside these concrete columns? Uh, the other application here, this is, a, uh, this is the automated people mover at Pearson Airport. This is the one that ferries you from Wicom Terminal uh, parking garage to, to Terminal 1 and back. Uh, there are these big gear, there's a big gearbox, one, on each, uh, one for each direction, uh, that's driving the cane. It's a funicular system that's just basically pulleys uh, and, and cables. And one of the main uh, aspects of condition maintenance for this piece of infrastructure uh, are these gearboxes. So we are looking at uh, automatically uh, detecting faults and also to predict the remaining useful life for these bearings using sensory data that we, uh, that we are collecting. So I'll give you an example of how we are doing these applications. Um, let's first talk about um, the uh, people mover at Pearson Airport. Uh, just uh, the kind of components that we're interested in for this train. This train is basically going from the value park garage, which is your Y count, uh, all the way to terminal one and back. And it has one station in the middle, and then you have the terminal stations. Um, the, it has a series of pulleys, um, sheaves, line sheaves, uh, and then the most important things are these uh, bearings on the gearbox itself here. Um, the idea here is to uh, instrument the gearbox and the sheaves with uh, a set of accelerometers and use this data to prognose failures. Uh, this work is, uh, this I, I'm, I'm working with uh, Jerome Anthony from Inso Lyon on this, uh, on this project. Um, let's talk about instrumentation. So what we have done here is we have gone in there to the, uh, to the gearboxes. We have instrumented uh, the, the gearbox with these accelerometers. For those of you who are not in vibration and acoustics, um, a lot of research over the last 30 years, 40 years has shown that in gearboxes, especially in rotating machinery, uh, the most uh, cost-effective way uh, to detect falls or to even predict failures is through vibration measurements and acoustic measurements. Okay, I'm using them synonymously, uh, but essentially they mean one and the same for the purposes of our study here. Uh, so the idea here is how are we taking uh, how are we taking these measurements here from this gearbox and, and, and accomplishing these, uh, these activities? Uh, the, there's a data acquisition system, and we talked a little bit about automation here. Uh, I'll, I'll speak to it in just a second. But essentially, this is the one that's carrying out most of the automation tasks for us. This is a very straightforward uh, national instruments-based system that's LabVIEW-enabled. Uh, and the types of faults that we are interested to uh, to measure are these bearing faults. This is a typical, what we call it, an uh, inner race fault on a bearing. This happened August of last year. Uh, so we want to sort of predict uh, faults of this nature before they happen on this gearbox. So how, did we achieve, how are we achieving autonomy in this application? So we've broken down the whole task of autonomy into two tiers. The first tier, we call it the diagnostics tier, where the diagnostics tier is actually happening on this automation system here. And the, this consists of, of course, data acquisition. So uh, the data acquisition has to be somewhat deterministic for us uh, because these are timestamp data at high data rates. Uh, so this is being uh, done by an FPGA layer uh, that's on this module. And that gives us near real-time deterministic measurements. Uh, the feature extraction, again, comes back to us not having to throw all the acoustic data via Wi-Fi into a server and process it later. We want to do all the processing while at the sensor location, at the location of measurements, so that we are not throwing all this high bandwidth data up onto the cloud. Uh, we're doing some of the feature extraction directly at the sensor node. Condition monitoring, so we're looking at, so we, there are some lookup tables that are placed there uh, based on statistical analysis where we are comparing these feature values with the statistical estimates to see if there's a fault. And a lot of generation, if there's a fault, there's a little text or an email that goes out from the, from the node to the respective user. So that's the tier one that's called the diagnostics. In tier two, which is the prognostics, uh, this is where we are doing these things offline, where this data is being sent to the modeling server where a lot of the stochastic modeling and random variable models that I showed you is happening there followed by estimation, the parameter estimation parts that I, I described earlier, and also maintenance planning. So this is sort of like the, the, the way we are actualizing the automation side for this application. So some details on the implementation. Uh, you know, so we have a server uh, that's doing, in this case, we are using Gaussian mixture models to do the updating 
uh, degradation model updating, and then the threshold updating, and this information, these thresholds from the server are being fed back to the CBM client. Uh, CBM stands for condition-based maintenance. This client is basically your, your national instruments uh, automation system that is sitting there, and these values that are coming from the server are, are updated within the CBM client, and then these lookup tables are dynamically updated. So that is sort of like the framework in which we have, we have implemented this. Uh, there are some more details about how, uh, which tasks are being done and how are they communicated to the server, which, which may or may not be that, that, that import critical for us right now. So, but this should give you like a general idea how we've implemented this. Now, let's talk a little bit about the degradation features themselves. You remember the environment model that I talked about at the beginning. The environment model itself uh, requires features. And here we are using a completely data-driven environment model. That means we're building these environment models straight out of the features. And in this case, we have a combination of raw vibration features. So we have vibration data collected. This is getting uh, processed into some uh, features. And then we also have some filtered signals that are getting converted into, into features. And then features based on some time frequency processing, more advanced methods uh, that we are exploring in our research here. Um, for feature extraction, again, real quickly, um, we are taking uh, data. This is, this is a typical vibration data from, from the train. So you can see very clearly the train starts, goes to the first, uh, so it starts here, goes to the station, then goes from here to here, that's this part of it, and then coming back, that's this part, and then this is the last leg. So there are four legs in this train, and the vibration data all shows very different characteristics. Uh, directly processing this data gives a lot of uh, false alarms. So you have to process this data in different, uh, different fashions. So what we are showing you here is called a power spectrum, and this is uh, showing you parts of the spectrum that are stationary and parts of the spectrum that are not stationary. So what we have developed in our groups is um, automatically extract these features based on the stationarity of these uh, the spectrum plots. So there is a methodology that we employ where we first do what is called a spectral kurtosis, and from the spectral kurtosis data, we are extracting regions of stationary, uh, extracting stationary regions of the travel path, and from the stationary uh, regions of the travel path, we're extracting what are the gear mesh harmonics, which are, blind, uh, which are unknown, assumed unknown a priori, and then from there, we are looking at uh, uh, regions of the spectrum, regions of the spectrum, which contain the most useful information for our environment model. So what is the model of the story in this, all these plots here? We have a raw vibration signal. We just cannot take that and plunk it into an analytics engine. You have to do some pre-processing. And the pre-processing should not assume a lot of characteristics are known. So we process this data through some signal processing techniques. And we have an automated way to select which portions of the data contain the damage sensitive features. And from those damage sensitive features, we can now write uh, do uh, fault modeling. Uh, this is our environment model. This is how our environment model looks like from those featured features. And then uh, once you have a feature model, environment model established, you can now parameterize these models using random variable models or stochastic gamma process models, Wiener process models, and so on. And once you have parameterized these things, you can use those parameter estimates to calculate the remaining useful life. Okay, so that's sort of like the captures the the general approach we are doing. Uh, then we have looked at uh, correlation. So, so these are some of the things we studied in terms of sensitivity of the different features, uh, looking at correlations between different phases of our model, and then. Of course, there are, there are several things that we can learn uh, from applying these standard techniques to this kind of an application. Uh, we, are also look, uh, we have also looked at these for structural applications. For example, if you have a piece of damage here, how are you going to, or if there is a, uh, there's a loss of bond uh, inside a reinforced concrete beam, uh, how can you use global uh, response measurements, be it deflections uh, or strain, and then use those to detect whether something is happening from within the structure? Same thing here. You have a large structure. You have a localized damage. How can you actually use, uh, uh, in this case, vibration data from a large structure to, to detect uh, hidden faults and failures. Uh, same idea here, we have uh, some laboratory testing where we, there are corroded concrete beams, uh, a bunch of strain gauges, LVDTs that are measuring the data, 
we can take that global measurement data, cast it into a stochastic process model, and use standard Bayesian mathematics to see if there are, uh, if there are changes in the slope which are indicative of faults or damage, and then we can use the same models to, uh, to predict uh, residual use, remaining useful life. And here these results show us that as more data comes available, you have better confidence in your estimates, which is sort of what makes, uh, what you would expect it to happen. Uh, not only for static measurements, we have looked at uh, this for dynamic measurements. You can look at accelerometer produced data from a hidden damage, and you can use things like T-square statistics and Hotlinks chart uh, to look uh, to develop features. So. The moral of the story here is there is no one recipe for a good damage sensitive feature. Every application has a different damage sensitive feature that you can extract. So we are able to calculate these damage sensitive features depending on the application. And we are finding that they're all working well uh, with the caveat that you understand the domain, you collect the data in a proper way, and you extract the features in a proper way. Again, here this shows some results where at different monitoring points, uh, you are projecting the estimates onto a failure threshold. And of course, the more early on you are, the more uncertain your RUL is. As you get closer and closer to its final, in this case, it's a 50-year failure life. As you get to 50, 50 uh, failure threshold, as you get closer and closer to the uh, expected uh, uh, useful life, you're going to get l more, and uh, more and more confidence in your remaining useful life estimates. So, okay, so that was the first application where I've talked about the actualization to autonomy. Okay, so I've given you an example how automation can help you estimate not only whether there is something wrong happening in your system or there's a damage in your system, it will also allow you to understand how do you predict the remaining useful life. So that gives you sort of one application. The second actualization enabler that's very important for you to actually go from data to knowledge uh, is, is an intelligent edge. And I'm going to give an ex example here. One of the projects that we are currently working on um, is in the area of water infrastructure. So in this case, uh, it's a classic case where intelligent edge is not a useful thing to have. It's a necessary thing to have uh, for, the, for, for the reasons that will become clear to you in just a second. Now, to give you a context on this, um, when you, when you look at a newspaper or turn on the news in winter, the, it's very likely local news, the first thing you're going to hear is there's a water main burst somewhere happening. Right? So winters are notorious for water main bursts. So well, one of the projects that we started looking at for in the context of smart infrastructure is can we predict water main bursts before they happen? So really, that's really the context in which we looked at this problem. And uh, if you look at, uh, let's not worry too much about why they're happening, because the, the reasons why water main bursts happen is like, there could be a multitude of reasons. Okay? A lot of it has to hap a lot of it has got to do with uh, thermal effects, how soil expands or contracts during winter, and combination of uh, pre-existing faults or damage or uh, in, within your pipe network itself, uh, by in, incorrect support the conditions for the pipe, constraints, and so on. So the multitude of factors, uh, but they're all related uh, to, to temperature uh, because these things happen predominantly, for example, 70% of the water main bursts happen during the months of, say, December through March, okay? So in most, in most municipalities. Uh, so without dealing too much into the causes of it, uh, let's talk about, uh, in the context of uh, intelligent edge, what can you do with respect to water infrastructure? So one of the things, uh, objectives of this work was to look at, uh, can we detect and localize small leaks in water distribution networks using sparsely distributed sensor networks? So if you have a sensor network that you can deploy in a large area, uh, can you detect and localize small leaks? Now, there are typically thousands of hydrants in a city of size of Toronto. So you cannot be reaming tons of data from each hydrant. Okay, each location. So clearly, there's a lot of processing that needs to happen, even at a sensor level, so that it's an economical proposition. So right there is a motivation to look at an actuation, uh, actuation, uh, actualization enabler that is an intelligent edge. Now, the other problem that we have looked at is what are the causative factors? I'm not going to talk too much about this, uh, but essentially, we are also trying to understand the physics behind why these failures are happening. And how do you actualize this in power and data constrained environment? So hydrants, especially if you go out into the field, power is ubiquitous inside your home, inside your residence or inside a commercial establishment, but power is extremely difficult to get out in the field. 
uh, especially if you're talking about instrumenting hundreds and hundreds of these things. So how can you do these things in a power and a data constrained environment? So these are some of the things that, that motivate, uh, motivate actualization uh, uh, enabler through a uh, enabling actualization through a intelligent edge. So the project that we are working on in my group is a hydrant based uh, event detection system where we are making these hydrants smart hydrants. So they have, I'll show you in just a second how we are, how we are measuring uh, the acoustic parameters here. But essentially the idea is to use these hydrants um, not at a network level or a subsystem level or at a pipe level, but somewhere between a pipe level and a subsystem level. So what do I mean by that? Typically uh, if, you, if you have a water main burst right now, uh, some, a, a citizen is going to look at flooding and he or she is going to report it to the municipality, the municipality will send out an inspector with some sort of a listening device and they go and locate where exactly that uh, the leak has occurred and they'll dig and repair the pipe. So that's really how things are done today. It's very reactive. Uh, but what we are trying to do is develop a continuous monitoring system that is placed at a city scale and that is continuously listening to uh, the acoustic conditions within the network that where if, if something is going to happen or a small leak has occurred in a region that alerts the municipality right away so that then they are prepared with the crews and they can send an inspector out there to localize it. So that's sort of like what we are trying to do here. And um, this project is actually collaborative with, uh, with uh, uh, one of our faculty at CS as well and three of my colleagues in, in my department. So essentially what this hydrant based system has, it's got a stem, this is the hydrant stem. It has got a set of sensors at the bottom of the stem. It has got a temperature sensor, pressure sensor, an acoustic pressure, acoustic pressure is a hydrophone and an accelerometer. So all these sensors are embedded at the bottom of the hydrant and you have a backhaul, a data backhaul that is transmitting all this data process data from here into the cloud. So the idea here is to take features from these measurements, compress them, it, of course it will be a lossy compression. So once you compress this data, you, then you can send a subset of the data from each hydrant out into the cloud so that you can process the data at a server and determine other things that can happen. So that is basically our intelligent edge. Now, Here's some pictures of our hydrant here. So this is there in the hydraulics lab. So the sensors, uh, the two sensors that you can readily see are the hydrophone and the pressure sensor. You have an accelerometer and a temperature gauge right at the board. So this gives you this multi-sensor modality. Uh, this data is being collected within the system and then hauled back into the data acquisition unit. And that is an older version of a data acquisition unit. Now we have a very, uh, a latest version of it that has got GPS and cellular connectivity and so on. So the idea is you, uh, you, take, uh, you take the data from here, you process the data, you compress the data, including data acquisition on the microcontroller, and then you send the loss, uh, the feature set out into the cloud. If there is anything happening at a local level, there are alarms that get triggered right here. That is the eventual goal of this. And then well, the more sophisticated environment models and other things can be built using the features that are in the cloud. So, uh, so I welcome you guys to take a look at it. This is in the hydraulics lab. Uh, there are a lot of tests being done. Uh, the event detection team, there's passive monitoring, so we're looking at machine learning classification type work, uh, detection, localization. We're also looking at active monitoring where we're using sonar principles to localize, uh, to, to, to localize leaks. Um, and we're looking at wave attenuation, distortion, and so on. So there are a number of things we are studying here, both from a basic physics level as well as from an actualization level. In terms of implementation, uh, the intelligent edge here has timing control, time series acquisition, position feature calculations and encryption all four of them are happening at the hydrant level right now we have we have uh, uh, we are removing the encryption part uh, the essential feature calculations are being programmed in the firmware as we speak uh, then we have a cellular connectivity to do the uh, data preparation and sharing and notifications. And then you have the usual analytics, archival, and results. So that's like the overall framework in which uh, this, this work is, uh, this uh, product is being developed. Uh, for feature extraction, I go, of course, you know, standard machine learning. We have several types of features where we have, to, here I'm showing you frequency peaks and root mean square, uh, applying standard things like uh, here we have, I'm showing you here the Bhattacharya distance that looks at distance between two histograms. And those types of uh, features give you an idea whether there is a leak occurring, uh, whether the data is associated with a leak or not. Okay. So standard machine learning techniques. Uh, more recent work uh, 
Uh, I have a postdoc looking at association rules. Uh, how can we apply association rules for leak and, uh, uh, detection uh, where the uh, discrimination using standard uh, support vector machines and all is very difficult. So you're developing these features using more sophisticated methods and then applying the association rule mining to, uh, to come up with much better leak indicators where the histograms are well separated. Uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the feature space. Um, so I have a student who's looking at understanding and quantifying risk. Why do pipes fail? Under what conditions? Can we predict, uh, uh, can we predict failures before they happen? Uh, so that's sort of looking at more on the soil physics type of things. I'm working with a colleague in the earth sciences to, to help me understand some of the physics behind uh, what, what's happening and what can cause these pipes to differentially move. And I have a collaborator at UC Davis who is helping us understand some of the mechanistic modeling aspects as well. So we have work going on in this, in this uh, uh, domain as well. Some field tests that we recently concluded, uh, this is in Guelph, city of Guelph. Uh, we put in our first hydrant actually in November. Uh, this is the backhaul that I talked about. There's power source, there's a radio antenna. All the microcontroller battery units are sitting up on the backhaul. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the hydrant stem. Uh, that's the sensor module that's going right underneath uh, into the hydrant. Uh, that's the master student who's, who did the first deployment. It turned out there were several hardware issues we found out in November. Uh, we just went back in last week with, with our new hardware prototype, which is which is working well. So this gives you an idea how uh, this is a classic application of an intelligent edge where you want to do a lot of processing up at the hydrant level rather than throwing reams of data into the cloud. Uh, so we are going into, uh, we are going into uh, uh, the city of uh, Markham and city of Toronto this year. So we have lots of field trials uh, scheduled uh, to understand how all this data and other things can be, uh, can be utilized. So the last one I want to show you is actualization through robotics. Okay, so I've talked about actualization to, through autonomy. I've talked about actualization through an intelligent edge. Okay, and finally, I want to talk a little bit about sensors themselves, how you want to uh, collect data in an autonomous fashion, how you can use robotics uh, to uh, better inform your data and better collect data and uh, better uh, interpret data as well. Okay, so a lot of the, uh, lot of the work uh, is ongoing, so we don't have any final results to show, but I'll give you, I'll hopefully at least motivate you what we are doing in this field. So uh, in the robotics side, what, how can infrastructure benefit from robotics? Of course, you've seen massive earth moving equipment, uh, you have demolishing equipment in robotics. So those have found very early adoption. But um, in terms of inspection and monitoring, which is where we come in, uh, the use of robotics has been somewhat limited, except in the, uh, in the nuclear industry or in the offshore industry, where robotics have seen a lot of, uh, a lot of adoption. But in typical civil infrastructure, uh, only now you're going to beginning to see a lot of drones coming for inspection, but we wanted to look at where uh, robotics can play a big role in terms of smart infrastructure, uh, especially as a actualization enabler. Um, so we're looking at, in our group, uh, some scanning platforms. Uh, scan to BIM. BIM stands for building information models, which are essentially semantic models. Uh, you, you, you know what a point cloud is. If you do a scan of an area, you get what is called a point cloud. You get geometric information, x, y, z coordinates of, of your surroundings. But if you embed other information into the, into the model, let us say this is concrete, this is steel, or this is uh, when somebody's doing a construction, this is a part of a wall that needs to be completed at certain sort of time, that becomes all of a sudden a semantic model, which has got more information than just geometric information. So you can embed such rich semantic models have applications in construction, applications in, in design, maintenance, and so on. So one of the things where we think actualization uh, through robotics can play a big role is scan to building information models. How can you go from a simple scan to a semantic model? We are looking at those. And then can we go from a scan to a semantic model to a finite element model? That would be the holy grail. So if I were to analyze this environment here, I could come in with a robot, scan this point cloud with a bunch of steps. I can just convert this model into actually a mechanistic model from which I can do simulations. Now I can do mechanical simulations out of this, which actually enhances our ability to uh, assess the condition of infrastructure even better. Uh, we can use robotics for control of vibrations, especially lightweight bridges, temporary construction, and so on. This is some of the work. I'll show you some of the work we are doing. On the control side, uh, we are using this as a lightweight robotic platform to control bridge vibrations. Uh, in this case, we are using this little robot uh, as a means to stabilize excessive motion in bridges. Uh, 
Uh, we've done some uh, studies here where I'm just going through some of the hardware components of this robot. I'll show you a video. I think that might be a better, uh, yeah, I'll show you a video here. So this is the robot that, that uh, we developed in our lab, which can be used to control vibrations and bridges here. Say a little example of a test that's going to take place. Um, the idea is you would position this robot in any structure. Uh, in this case, we are doing what is called a hardware in loop, loop simulation where the robot and the bridge structure in this case are coupled in real time. So you don't see the bridge itself moving because the bridge is moving on the computer virtually and the robot is moving physically and then you're coupling them in real time. So these are the real time simulations. So the idea here is you would bring this robot up to a bridge that is undergo either temporary or army type applications uh, to, for stabilization. Uh, then we have, uh, I have a student here, we are looking at this for structural health monitoring. So if you want to inspect a piece of bridge, you would potentially, you could potentially move this robot along the bridge and you would excite and measure these things and estimate the, the model parameters that I, I mentioned at the very beginning and then use those model parameters estimated through these measurements to prognose what is the are you, uh, remaining useful life or anything you want to do with the bridge. That's one of the ideas. The other thing that we are working on is on developing the scanning platform Platforms. The same robot I showed you, we are using to develop scan to building information models where we are taking this robot uh, using uh, a set of uh, LIDARs, which are basically scan laser scanners, and then developing point clouds. Here's a video that's probably a little bit more interesting to watch. So here's a video of uh, that scanning platform where if you have, this is our campus here. We're driving this robot through the campus, and as we are driving, we are scanning the the surroundings, the infrastructure uh, surrounding this robot, and using this uh, information to uh, to uh, see if uh, something uh, uh, to better inform inspections, essentially. So this uh, uh, this application uh, is aimed at uh, underside of bridges. So the motivation for for this particular scanning platform came from uh, the inability to inspect properly the underside of these bridges, especially the soffits, uh, which they are supposed to inspect on a regular basis, but there are unable to because of access and other reasons. So we, what we wanted to do here is we wanted to see if we can build a scanning platform that can essentially scan the underside of the bridges and colorize these point clouds using thermal and other types of uh, sensor, uh, sensor information so that you can predict. So this is the scanning platform that's, that is the underside of a, of a bridge here in Conest over Conestogo River. Uh, I think I forgot this is the, very exactly, this is north of town. Uh, so where we can look at uh, what's happening to the underside of these and then uh, overlay these things with regular images so that you know if there's a piece of concrete that has fallen. I'll show you some, some examples here. Uh, in this case, um, uh, for example, this particular girder had uh, some visible damage. Uh, one of the main problems in bridge inspection is you would not know how much of that concrete has spalled. One of the things you could do then is you could take the scanned LIDAR laser scanner information and colorize that point cloud using images, or in this case, you, we have colorized it using infrared for delamination, and you can quantify how much of concrete has actually spalled off, how much damage, you can quantify concrete damage and so on. So this can be used for, for damage quantification. Um, so that's sort of like my overview of what we do in my group. Uh, just as a wrap up, uh, I think I'm, I'm right on time, I guess. Um, one of the things that I want to say before we get all lost in the technology of how we are doing it is one of the things I will say is data is cheap. I mean, cheap is relative, but what I find is gathering data has actually become quite easy but actual information is difficult to obtain. So every application poses its own challenges and to actualize a technology in each application is very different. So I find actionable information is so much more difficult to obtain than actually data itself. Now, the other thing which I, I feel is the growth in computing um, uh, is forcing us really to rethink how we collect data and especially how do we automate the process of collecting data, processing that information. Um, one other thing which I, I want to throw out there is we cannot achieve autonomy by thinking we can code an expert. So the mindset, at least in civil engineering discipline, is, okay, so I have this intelligent system, and I want to take this intelligent system and make this intelligent system mimic an expert. So I'm going to write a piece of code that's going to mimic an expert. Think of neural networks. So, But what I feel is uh, to achieve autonomy, you just simply cannot code an expert. What you have to do is you have to look at a fundamental rethinking
of the underlying theoretical and programmatic concepts. So you cannot simply say, hey, I am going to do this the way a person is thinking. You have to look at, okay, I want to achieve autonomy. Maybe to achieve autonomy, I cannot code an expert. I have to rethink this in a completely different way. That means that the underpinning theory has to be revisited. So there are some, some aspects that I think are worthwhile to, to look into and think about uh, in, if you want to think about achieving autonomy in these applications. So I uh, personally am a big advocate of using robotics for infrastructure condition assessment because uh, frankly, robotics have become quite cheap. The sensors that go on these robots have become very accessible. There's a lot of uh, automation possible in robotics. And you can apply a lot of these principles directly on, on platforms such as robots. So I think a future of infrastructure uh, is, is, is intricately linked with uh, robotics. And I think in about 30, 40 years, you're going to see a lot of robots just inspecting bridges, inspecting large pieces of infrastructure. You're going to have climbing robots. You're going to have robots that are going to go up onto the electrical transmission wires to inspect these wires. So I think a lot of the, a lot of the future is already there, but I think in about 20, 25 years, you're going to find uh, much of the field in civil infrastructure being governed by, by robots. So thanks to the industry partners and my group, some of who are here. Okay, and uh, please uh, feel free to visit us in our lab, and I can show you some of the, uh, the platforms that we're developing, and thank you for your time. for your presentation. Uh, I have two questions. One is about the cost, share of cost of um, sensors for, for just, um, uh, just uh, recording data uh -huh. uh, uh, in terms of uh, total cost of the system. So like it depends on what, what you, okay. So sensors come in all shapes and sizes and varieties, right? So they can range from I would say if you go on DigiKey, you can buy an accelerometer, triaxial accelerometer for a few cents, right? But of course, you can't do much with it because it has to be packaged in an OEM to get it through. So, and then you can go all the way to laser scanners that can cost hundreds and thousands of dollars. Like right? they're all sensors. So it really depends on the application. But key thing, I think what you're alluding to is if you're dealing with infrastructure, infrastructure, is by definition, a lot of them are large, right? The types of infrastructure we are dealing with are, lar are typically very large. That means they have to scale. Any sensor you're going to put in there cannot be prohibitively expensive. So I don't have a answer for you how much a data acquisition system costs uh, for each one of them. For example, the whole robotic platform that I showed you is probably 50,000, whereas the first one I showed you on the gearboxes, each sensor is about $1,000. So. Sorry? Of the cost of infrastructure? Oh, for a, a cost, a capital cost or the operational cost? Okay, so good point. So in the airport, I'll give you an example. For the conveyor system, uh, we priced out, the conveyor system cost them about, uh, in terminal one, uh, they, it cost them about, uh, I would say about uh, six million to maintain every year. And there are about 12,000 bearings. Uh, we did a cost takeoff on that. Uh, typically, uh, uh, a motor, uh, a, a gear motor, costs them about 2,000 to 2,500, and that can run two sections. And to instrument the gear motor costs about $300. So if you look at the cost of sensor, data acquisition versus cost of gear motor per channel, uh, is 300 to 2,500. So you, it'll add maybe 15% of the cost, 20% of the cost to your unit for a small electromechanical system. Uh, but when you talk about large pieces of infrastructure like a hydroelectric dam, that instrumentation costs close to a million dollars for them. And, but the cost of dam is hundreds of millions. So, so it really depends. So uh, if you think electromechanical component anywhere from 15 to 20%, if you think about a dam, uh, of that nature, I don't even know what the cost of inspection for a dam is because they have full-time employees that do these things on a yearly basis. So it's kind of hard. Um, how about the place of sensor? I mean, uh, uh, it should be some plan where we should install the sensor. Correct. 
Exactly. So you can't just populate your sensors everywhere. You need to have some domain knowledge. Yes, absolutely correct. So, uh, for example, if you're going on a gearbox, you need to understand which direction is sensitive to bearing faults versus axial misalignments. If you're going to a structure, you need to, if you're, if you're instrumenting a ship, for example, you need to know where the typical fatigue failures happen. Those are transverse and longitudinal uh, uh, bulkheads, right? So you know, okay, when I go into a ship, this is where I need to instrument because that's the most fatigue critical location. If I go to a bridge, I should know which is the location that is most critical. Yes, so that domain knowledge is needed. Otherwise, you're just instrumenting it everywhere without, yeah. So uh, on behalf of uh, Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy and the wonderful audience sitting here, we would like to thank you, sir, for your thank wonderful you. presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for coming. Yep.